Hello and welcome to our video summarising all you need to know about the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. My name is Barbara and in this video we'll begin by looking at the novel itself. We'll start by examining a little bit about context, especially relating to the author Oscar Wilde himself and also the reviews and the reception of this novel when it was first published in the 1800s. We'll then examine the novel, firstly examining the plot on the whole before examining the summary of each chapter of the novel and we will end by looking at themes that are really important that, and you need to be aware of if you're studying this novel for your exams or your coursework. So let's get started. Now, The Picture of Dorian Gray is a philosophical fantasy novel by, Do by Oscar Wilde and it was first published in 1890 by Lippincott's monthly magazine. However, the editors feared the story was indecent, so the magazine's editor deleted roughly 500 words before publishing it without Wilde's knowledge. And despite this censorship, this book still offended the moral sensibilities of a lot of British book reviewers at the time. And some even said that Oscar Wilde merited prosecution for violating laws regarding public morality. Although Wilde did defend his novel as well as his art, he did make some excisions, which means he also censored some parts before revising and lengthening the story for publication in the following year, which is 1891. Now, of course, to understand this book, you need to understand a little bit about the author himself. So Oscar Wilde was born in Dublin in 1854 and he was very flamboyant and he was seen as very witty. He was of course a playwright, a poet and a critic. He went to Trinity College in Oxford and he then became a famous proponent of aestheticism which is a controversial theory of art which we'll look at in some detail. And of course his best known book is The Picture of Dorian Gray. He published this Faustian novel in 1890 and this is when he fell in love with a much younger man called Lord Alfred Douglas and of course this really colours our perception of Dorian Gray himself and of course his relationship with Basil Hallward and Lord Henry. Oscar Wilde himself began a double life and he won lots of fame and fortune with his three huge full successful comedies, Lady Windermere's Fan, An Idle Husband and The Importance of Being Earnest. However, he led a double life and he secretly spent time in male brothels. In his famous letter to Lord Alfred Douglas, he said that the danger was half of the excitement of leading the secret life. Now, in 1895, Douglas's father, the Marquis of Queensbury, accused Wilde of being a sodomite. Wilde sued him for libel, however he lost and he was subsequently seen as guilty of gross indecency. This led him to spend two years in prison and when he was released, he then ended up going to Paris and he spent his final years there and he died in 1900 and he was aged 46, so he had ultimately a tragic ending due to his sexuality. Now, broadly speaking, when you're thinking about Dorian Gray, the story begins in the art studio of Basil Hallward, who's discussing a current painting with his witty, amoral friend, Lord Henry Wotton. Henry thinks that the painting, a portrait of a very extraordinarily beautiful young man, should be displayed. However, Basil disagrees, and he fears that his obsession with the portrait's subject, Dorian Gray, can be seen in this work, so he doesn't want to reveal this because this potentially could reveal his own soul. Dorian then arrives and he's fascinated as Henry explains his belief that one should live life to the fullest by indulging in one's impulses, in other words, living a very hedonistic life. Henry also points out that beauty and youth are fleeting and Dorian declares that he would really give his soul if his portrait were to grow old and wrinkle whilst he remained young and handsome. Basil then gives a painting to Dorian as a gift. Henry decides to make, to take on rather, the project of moulding Dorian's personality and a few weeks later Dorian tells Henry that he's fallen in love with an actress called Sybil Vane because of her great beauty and acting talent. He invites Henry and Basil to go with him to a very dingy theatre to see Sybil perform, however her performance is terrible. Sybil then explains to Dorian that now she knows what real love is, she can't pretend to be on love on stage and of course this is what robs her of her acting talent. Dorian is repulsed by this and he wants nothing further to do with her and when he gets home he sees a really cruel expression on the face of his portrait and so he decides to seek Sybil's forgiveness because he feels some remorse. However the next day he finds out that Sybil has committed suicide and Lord Henry convinces Dorian that there's no reason that Dorian should feel badly about this. Dorian then, feeling guilty and somehow 
inculcated in this, removes the portrait and places it in his attic, which he shuts. Henry then sends Dorian a book that he finds poisonous and fascinating. Under this book's influence, Dorian spends the next 18 years of his life in the pursuit of capricious excess and he becomes increasingly drawn to evil and self-indulgence. Dorian does frequently visit this portrait which is hidden away, noting the signs of ageing and corruption that appear on the portrait. However, he himself remains unblemished, he seems perfect and beautiful. One evening, Dorian does run into Basil several years later, and Basil tells him that there are rumours that he's destroyed the lives and reputations of very many people. Dorian, however, refuses to accept any blame, and Basil declares that he really doesn't know Dorian, who responds by taking him to the attic to see this portrait that Basil had created. The painting has become horrifying, and Basil tells Dorian that if this is a reflection of his soul, he must repent and pray for forgiveness, and a very suddenly enraged Dorian murders Basil. Dorian then blackmails another friend into disposing his body. Later, Dorian then goes into an opium den where Sybil's vengeful brother James finds him. However, the fact that Dorian still appears quite young dissuades him from acting on his anger. However, somebody else who works in the den later tells James Dorian's age and James realises that he's been misled. At a subsequent hunting party, Dorian's country estate, one of the hunters accidentally shoots and kills James, who was hiding in a thicket. Some weeks later, Dorian tells Henry that he's decided to become virtuous and recently decided against taking advantage of another young girl who was smitten with him. Dorian goes to see if the portrait has improved because of his honourable act, but he sees it's acquired a look of cunning. He ultimately decides to destroy this portrait, and he stabs it with a knife. His servants hear a scream, and when they arrive, they see a loathsome old man who's done on the floor, with a knife in his chest. And now, in place, the portrait has a beautiful young man who he once was. Now, to go into a chapter-by-chapter summary of this novel, because, of course, it's really important to understand what happens in each chapter. So let's begin with chapter one. So this chapter, of course, as mentioned before, opens in the London studio of Basil Horwood, who's an artist. Reclining with him and smoking a cigarette is Lord Henry, who he also refers to as Harry. Basil is finishing a portrait of a young man of extraordinary personal beauty, and Henry praises this portrait as Basil's best work. To Henry's surprise, however, Basil states that he won't show it anywhere, and the novel says, I've put too much of myself into it. Of course, there are homoerotic themes and undertones underneath this. Basil tries to keep the painting subject a secret from Lord Henry, however, he accidentally discloses that the beautiful young man's name is Dorian Gray. Basil admits that he prefers to keep favourite people to himself, not even telling others their names, because he feels he might lose part of them. Even when when Basil takes this trip, he keeps the destination private, and this is a revelation that becomes important much later in the story. Basil does have some secrecy to him. Lord Basil, rather Lord Henry, acts that he understands. However, he seems more interested in Basil's reason for not exhibiting the portrait. And Basil responds that any painting done with true feeling for his muse reveals more of the artist than than it does the subject, and he fears this painting will reveal the secret of his own soul. Basil explains how he met Dorian at Lady Brandon's home. He felt terror upon first seeing Dorian because he sensed that the young man's personality was so powerful and electric that it could absorb Basil himself, and of course he was correct. More important, Dorian inspires a fresh approach in art in Basil, and it allows him to produce the best work of his professional life. Because Basil worries that the public will detect his personal and artistic idolatry of Grey, he refuses to exhibit the portrait. And this echoes a basic tenet of aestheticism that an artist should create beautiful work for its own sake. And art really shouldn't mean anything. When Lord Henry expresses a desire to meet Grey, Basil explains that he wants to keep Dorian and the painting hidden away so that Lord Henry doesn't corrupt them. However, at that moment, a butler enters and announces the arrival of Dorian and Lord Henry laughs that they must meet now. Before entering the studio where Dorian is waiting, Basil asks and in some ways pleads for Lord Henry not to influence or take away the person who inspires him as an artist. In chapter two, this chapter begins as Basil and Lord Henry enter the studio. 
when Lord Henry meets Dorian, he notices Dorian is so handsome and, the novel says, all the candour of youth was there, as well as youth's passionate purity. Dorian is intrigued by Lord Henry, and he's intrigued that he might be a bad influence despite Basil's own wishes that he has nothing to do with him. Lord Henry responds prophetically with one of his aphorisms. As the novel says, there's no such thing as a good influence, Mr. Grey. All influence is immoral. That is, to influence someone is to alter their view and indelibly corrupt them with your own view. Dorian senses, as the novel says, entirely fresh influences which work within him. And whilst Basil asks Lord Henry to go, Dorian himself begs him to stay. Dorian wants to try not to think, however, uh, but Lord Henry influences him. He then manages to convince Lord Henry to stay in spite of Basil's refusal. And we find that Lord Henry starts to really heavily influence Dorian through his discussion. He tells the man that the only senses that can cure the soul, just as the soul is the only remedy for the senses. Speaking at length on the virtues of youth and beauty, Lord Henry claims that beauty is a form of genius and he urges Dorian to be selfish with his youth while he is while he has it and to seek what he calls a new hedonism, elevating the pursuit of pleasure and dominate to a dominating level. For Lord Henry, youth and beauty are the finest of treasures and they should be cherished. Dorian is frightened, however, he's also stirred by Lord Henry's speech. And of course, this speech is a turning point which starts to infect Dorian his, himself. And with his mindset, it starts taking away his innocence. Basil interrupts and asks the two to rejoin him in the studio so that he can finish the portrait of Dorian. And once Dorian looks at this painting, he's quite moved as he sees himself for the first time and he recognises his beauty. He envies the figure in the painting, this painting that will forever remain beautiful while he grows old and we find that Dorian becomes quite terrified of ageing and he hopes and he repeats his wish that the portrait might age while he remains young. So of course this is when a supernatural element is infused. Basil accuses Lord Henry of causing all this turmoil within Dorian, however Lord Henry says that he's merely brought forth the true Dorian from within. Basil then decides to destroy the portrait rather than have it upset the lives of the men. However, Dorian stops him. And after a sense of calm is restored, Henry invites Dorian to join him at the theatre in the evening. And of course, Basil ends up giving Dorian the portrait as a gift. Now in chapter three, it's half past noon the next day. Lord Henry calls on his uncle, Lord Firma, to learn more a little bit about Dorian's heritage. His uncle is a delightful old curmudgeon. He's wealthy, cynical and very knowledgeable about everyone else's business, especially in high society. And he and Lord Henry divulge into Dorian's past. We learn that Dorian is a grandson of Lord Kelso and Kelso's daughter, Margaret Devereux. And Lady Margaret was an extremely beautiful woman who was displeased, who displeased her father rather by marrying beneath her as she married a penniless, low-level soldier, as Lord Firma recalls. Kelso his, her father also hired some Belgian brute to insult her husband and lure him into a duel for which he was killed. And Lady Margaret, however, was pregnant with Dorian. She died within a year or so of the duel and Kelso also ultimately died and left his fortune to Dorian. The mother also had money of her own, so we learn that Dorian is very well off financially. Dorian then attends a luncheon and he meets Lord Henry again. And whilst Lord Henry dem dominates the conversation, delighting the audience, he says, I can sympathise with everything except suffering. We learn, of course, that Lord Henry is a devout aesthetic. He wants people to sympathise with beauty, the use of colour and the joy of life and nothing else. To an ageing du duchess at the party, Lord Henry suggests, to get to back to one's youth, one has merely to repeat one's follies and he launches into a triumphant monologue in praise of folly, which echoes his speech to Dorian the day before Basil's garden. And after the luncheon, Lord Henry and Dorian leave together. Now in chapter four, a month later, Dorian waits for Lord Henry in Henry's library at Mayfair. He's sulking and annoyed until someone at the door interrupts his mood, and it's Lord, not Lord Henry, but his wife. Lady Henry is familiar with Dorian, having seen Lord Henry's photographs of the young men and having noticed Dorian with Lord Henry recently at the opera. In her brief appearance, Lady Henry seems as witty as her husband and equally indifferent towards convention. 
Lord Henry then enters, complaining about the hours he spent trying to bargain for a piece of elegant fabric. And after Lady Henry leaves, he comments lightly on the disappointments of marriage, and vol Dorian volunteers that he doubts he'll ever marry because he's too much in love with an actress named Sybil Vane. He recounts his discovery of Sybil in an absurd little theatre in the East End of London, which of course at the time was seen as a very rundown area that gentlemen were not supposed to frequent. Dorian said that he'd gone out one evening to seek adventure, recalling Henry's advice in search of beauty. And in front of the theatre, he recalls that there was, as the novel says, a hideous Jew named Mr. Isaac. Dorian was so amused with this man that he paid an entire guinea, which is currency, for a private theatre box where he witnessed Sybil Vane replay Romeo and Juliet. And he was so entranced by her magnificent performance that he was immediately smitten. Lord Henry then, after hearing this, offers a few sceptical remarks about Dorian's dramatic description of his newfound love. However, he doesn't oppose his young friend's choice to love the actress. Dorian is concerned that Lord Henry will assume that all actresses are horrid people and he invites him to go and watch Sybil perform. The love struck Dorian again continues talking about his meeting with Sybil Vane who's immediately dubbed him Prince Charming because he then goes backstage and we learn that he meets this actress. As Dorian Gray divulges of his love for Sybil Vane, we find that Lord Henry observes this in a very detached way. He seems quite detached about Dorian's romance. However, he agrees to meet Dorian and Basil for dinner and to go later to see Sybil Vane in a play. Dorian then leaves for the theatre and Lord Henry muses in this situation. We learn, as the novel says, that he feels not the slightest pang of annoyance or jealousy that Sybil may intervene in their growing friendship, but rather these new developments make his protégé a more interesting study. In the evening, he goes off to find Dorian, and we also learn at the end of this chapter that Dorian has announced to him that he is engaged to be married, and he announces this through a telegram. Now in chapter 5, we learn a little bit more about Sybil Vane. We'll find her and her mother discussing the girl's relationship with this Prince Charming and Sybil seems really elated and wants her mother to share her joy as she's in love. However, we find that Mrs Vane, her mother, is far more realistic and cynical and somewhat down to earth. She wants her daughter to think of her career. The situation is complicated by the fact that the Vanes owe Mr Isaacs, the Jewish man, £50, which is a great deal of money, and Miss Vane wishes for Sybil to pay off this debt. It seems that Sybil has the enthusiasm of an innocent 17-year-old. And in one of Wilde's more effective metaphors, he says that the joy of a caged bird was within her voice. Sybil doesn't care anymore about Mr Isaacs or money. All she cares about is her Prince Charming. We'll also meet Sybil's 16-year-old brother James, who's set to sell for Australia. And he enters the room and he's really angry towards London, towards England's class system and towards the life that they live. Mrs. Vane feels ill and to ease around her son, fearing that he might suspect some secret that she keeps. However, Sybil is more girlish, sweet and innocent, and she seems that he's delighted that he's still around, and they go off for a walk, where she divulges to him about the person who she loves. We find that during the walk in the park where after they've left the mother, James is still very brooding and angry. While Sybil tells him about her Prince Charming and she fantasizes out loud, somewhat in a childlike manner, about the great success that her brother will be after going to Australia. James, who hears about this Prince Charming, hates him and he hates them the more because he's a gentleman from the upper class. James then warns his sister that the man wants to enslave her and he repeatedly threatens that he will kill him if anything bad comes to Sybil as a result. And of course, this foreshadows what will eventually happen. We find that James is especially angry that Dorian suddenly passes through the park in an open carriage, but only Sybil actually sees him. He's also angry with his mother and at the theatre one night months before, he'd heard a whispered sneer about her. After James and Sybil return from the walk, James confronts his mother. He wants to know that if he, if she and his father were actually married. There's then a very melodramatic scene and Mrs. Vane essentially tells him that they didn't marry. James accuses their father of being a scoundrel. However, his mother defends the man. She knew that she, he wasn't free when she got involved with him. He was a gentleman. James uses this to insist that Sybil should not be with this suitor, her gentleman. 
and he continues to repeat that he will track down this gentleman caller and kill him like a dog if he wrongs Sybil. Now in chapter 6, this is a transitional chapter and it's one of the shortest in the books. The setting for this chapter is a small private dining room at Bristol and Lord Henry greets Basil as he enters and then immediately asks if he's heard that Dorian is engaged to be married. Basil is really stunned at this information and Lord Henry tells him that he will be marrying an actress. Basil seems genuinely upset at this news. He seems quite incredulous firstly because this woman that he's supposedly marrying is from a different class to him. However, of course, we find that he's unhappy because Dorian hadn't told him. However, Lord Henry seems to be somewhat more passive about it and he explains to Basil that life is not for really making such judgments. Every experience is of some worth, he suggests, and maybe Dorian might be even more interesting if he marries. For Lord Henry, the problem with marriage is more often than not it makes people unselfish and unselfish people lose their individuality. For Lord Henry, the purpose of life is to know oneself in a very selfish way. Dorian then arrives and we find that he's giddy with love. He's looking forward to this performance with Sybil. He talks about the previous night when Sybil played Rosalind in Shakespeare's As You Like It and how mesmerised he was. And backstage after the performance, he says that the lovers unexpectedly kiss, Sybil trembling, and she felt her knees and kissed Dorian's hands. He's delighted that they're engaged. However, Dorian ends his recollection by stating, almost boasting, that he had embraced Rosalind and kissed Juliet on the mouth, both characters whom Sybil played. And we find that perhaps he's in love with the ideal that Sybil represents, rather than Sybil, the woman herself. Basil seems overwhelmed at all of this information. However, Lord Henry behaves like a shrewd lawyer. He asks specific things about marriage. However, subtly, he doesn't seem to be too invested in Dorian's story. Dorian is upset at the insinuation that perhaps Lord Henry doesn't necessarily believe that the marriage will work. Even if there hasn't been a formal proposal, he seems to believe that him and Sybil were destined to be together. They then leave for the theatre. Now in chapter 7, both or rather all three men arrive in the theater and the theater is crowded with Dorian, Basil and Lord Henry as well as other guests. When Sybil appears on stage she's performing as Juliet however her performance is lackluster. Even if Lord Henry believes her to be a beautiful creature all three men find that her performance is listless and artificial. In fact her performance is awful. We also see that Dorian appears really disgusted and somewhat embarrassed by Sybil's acting. And Lord Lord Henry and Basil leave, as does half of the audience. However, Dorian sits through the entire play. Once the play is finished, Sybil seems overjoyed at her dismal performance and expects Dorian to understand that she can no longer act because she's actually found true love in her real life. She intended to be outstanding, but because Dorian has taught her what love really is, she can no longer fake love in her stories. However, Dorian is quite cold and his response is filled with disgust. The novel says, he says, you've killed my love. We learn that Dorian loved her because she was a great performer. However, now he finds her very shallow and stupid and he can barely stand her. Sybil is distraught by his sudden shift. Even if she apologises and pleads with Dorian to give her another chance, Dorian doesn't listen to her. He storms out and leaves her crying hysterically. Dorian is annoyed with Sybil and he wanders the streets till near dawn, then returns home. Once he gets in, he passes through his library towards his bedroom. However, he notices and becomes disturbed by the fact that the portrait of that Basil painted of him has shifted. It's slightly changed and what we learn is that the portrait has a look of cruelty around the mouth. He suddenly feels some remorse and he recalls the wish he made earlier at Basil's studio that the portrait might change and he might not. He wasn't sure that this wish could ever be fulfilled, however we find that he has indeed unwittingly entered into a Faustian pact. These cruel lines around the mouth show Dorian that perhaps he might have been cruel to Sybil. However, he convinces himself that he's not to blame for the situation 
Sybil is to blame because she disappointed him with her terrible performance. Eventually, however, he convinces himself that Sybil hadn't really loved him, and he concludes that he doesn't need to be concerned about her at all, and then he goes to sleep. We also learn that Dorian is more concerned about the change portrait than Sybil herself and than Sybil's own feelings. It occurs to Dorian that every sin he commits will be reflected in the face of the canvas. He vows never to sin again so that the painting like himself will never change. Thus, he vows not to change, not because of the morality of the action, but more because he doesn't want to see the shift in the painting. So we find that as the novel progresses, of course, he becomes increasingly narcissistic. Now in chapter 8, that afternoon, Dorian wakes up very late and we find that he's received a letter from Lord Henry. However, he sets it aside without opening it. Later, Dorian wonders if his portrait has really changed or if he was seeing things because of how late he was. He builds up the courage and finds his portrait, which he had hidden behind a screen, and he realises the portrait has changed and he remembers the events of the night before. This altered portrait forces Dorian to acknowledge his cruelty to Sybil Vane, and he decides that he's going to beg her for forgiveness. He writes a letter to her, and as he finishes writing the letter, he feels absolved of any cruelty to Sybil. Later on, Lord Henry knocks at the library door and insists on speaking to Dorian. He seems unusually consoling, but advises Dorian not to dwell on the situation concerning Sybil, which is dreadful. Dorian hasn't yet read this letter, and he's very confused. He then tells Lord Henry of his plans to make amends and marry Sybil. Lord Henry then is quite agitated and asks if Dorian has received his letter. Dorian admits he did, but he hasn't read it, and Lord Henry breaks the news to him that Sybil Vane is dead. Dorian is in shock, and he learns that at about half past midnight the previous night, Sybil and her mother were leaving the theatre. She excused herself, saying she'd left something, however she didn't return. People curious went back to find where she was, and they find that she was dead from ingesting poison. Lord Henry appears concerned. However, he's not so much concerned about Sybil Bain's own suicide, but with keeping Dorian out of the scandal. And he asks Dorian to spend the evening with him at the opera, so that the unpleasantness of the suicide doesn't get into Dorian's nerves. Lord Henry need not be concerned about Dorian's nerves, as Dorian admits that he murdered Sybil. He appears to say in a very detached manner that the whole affair seems to, as the novel says, wonderful for tears. It's interesting that instead of feeling remorse over Sybil's death, Dorian moves us that his first le love letter was written to a dead girl. Within only a few seconds, he concludes that Sybil's suicide was very selfish of her. It leaves him without the guidance that marriage to her might have provided. Lord Henry then offers several, several glib comments on marriage, specifically on what a disaster marriage would have been. Dorian then wonders why he can't feel a tragedy, as much as he thinks he should, and wonders if he's heartless. To him, the death of Sybil seems like, as the novel says, a wonderful ending to a wonderful play. Lord Henry then finds exquisite pleasure in playing on his unconscious egotism, and he's pleased to extend a smile. He reassures Dorian that he isn't heartless. The experience has indeed been like a brilliant play, and that's how Dorian should regard the matter. Dorian then confesses that he's felt everything that Lord Henry said that he was afraid to admit, which is to do with indulging in his own pleasures and indulging in his own hedonistic desires. Assured by his mentor, Lord Henry, that his extraordinarily good looks will present him with a rich life, Dorian thanks him and calls him his best friend. Lord Henry leaves, and then Dorian checks the portrait, which hasn't changed since early that day. The portrait registers the events that they happen. Dorian wishes he could actually observe it changing, and for a moment he feels some remorse towards Sybil, but he brushes the feeling away, vowing to go on and seek, as the novel says, eternal youth, infinite passion, and pleasures subtle and secret, wild joys and wilder sins. Now in chapter 9... Basil, the next day, comes to offer his condolences to Dorian, but it seems that Dorian is very callous and he's dismissed the memory of Sybil quite lightly and he remarks, what's done is done, what is past is past. Basil is horrified at this change and he blames Lord Henry for Dorian's heartless attitude. 
Indeed, in discussing Sybil's death, Dorian uses some, many of the same phrases and arguments that Lord Henry offers. When Dorian refuses to acknowledge any kind of remorse or any kind of responsibility, Basil asks if he's displeased with this portrait, which Basil wants to show at an exhibition now. When Basil wishes to see this portrait and he goes on to remove the screen with which Dorian has covered it, Dorian's composure cracks. He insists that the work can never appear in public and pledges never to speak to Basil again should he touch the screen. Remembering Basil's original refusal to, draw, to show the painting, Dorian asks why he's changed his mind and Basil confessed that he was worried that the painting would reveal his obsession with Dorian. Now, however, Basil believes that the painting, like all art, conceals the artist far more completely than it ever reveals him. Basil asks Dorian to sit for him, but Dorian again refuses, and when Basil leaves, Dorian decides to hide his portrait. Now in chapter 10, once Basil is gone, Dorian orders his servant Victor to go to a nearby frame maker and bring back two men. He then calls his housekeeper Mrs. Leaf and asks for a key to an unused schoolroom which is at the top of the house. Dorian covers the portrait with an ornate satin coverlet and when the two frame makers arrive, they help him go and put it upstairs which he hides it. Dorian then locks the painting in the room and he returns to the study, settles down to read a book that Lord Henry has sent him. This book is described as a yellow book, and it's accompanied by a newspaper account of Sybil's death. Horrified by the ugliness of the report, Dorian turns to the book, which traces the life of a young Parisian who devotes his life to, as the novel says, all the passions and modes of thought that belonged to every century except his own. After reading a few pages, Dorian is entranced. He finds the work to be a poisonous book, one that confuses the boundaries between vice and virtue. When Dorian later meets Henry for dinner, he pronounces that the work is fascinating. Now in chapter 11, under the influence of this yellow book that Lord Henry has sent him, Dorian's character startly starts to begin to change. He orders nearly half a dozen copies of these first edition and has them bound in different colours to suit his shifting mood. Years pass and Dorian remains young and beautiful. However, he's trailed by rumours that he indulges in dark, sordid behaviour. Most people, however, can't help but dismiss these stories since Dorian's face retains an unblemished look of purity and innocence, which of course highlights Victorian hypocrisy. Whatever appears to be on the surface is what's accepted. Dorian delights in the ever-widening gulf between the beauty of his body and the corruption of his soul, and he reflects that too much human experience has been sacrificed to asceticism and pledges to live a life devoted to discovering the true nature of his senses. Always intellectually curious, he keeps up with the theories of the day, from mysticism to Darwinism. However, he never lets these theories dominate him or interfere with his experiences. Dorian also devotes himself to the study of beautiful things, perfumes and the psychological effects, music, jewellery, embroideries and tapestries. He also continues to watch the painted image of his, himself age and deteriorate. Sometimes the sight of the portrait fills him with horror, whilst at other times he reflects joyfully on the burdens that his body has been spared. However, he increasingly fears that someone will break into his house and steal the painting. He knows many men whisper of a scandal behind his back and they would delight in his downfall. Now in chapter 12, on the eve of his 38th birthday, Dorian runs into Basil on a fog-covered street. Some time has passed and the two men have not seen each other, and Dorian tries to pass him unrecognised, but Basil recognises him and calls him, and accompanies him home. Basil mentions that he's about to leave for a six-month stay in Paris, but felt it necessary to stop by and warn Dorian that terrible rumours are being spread about his conduct. He reminds Dorian that there's no such thing as secret vices. Sin, he claims, writes itself across a man's face. Having said these words, Basil demands to know why so many of Dorian's friendships have ended so disastrously. Basil then chastises Dorian for his influence over these unfortunate people that he's been involved with and urges him to use his considerable power and his upper class status for good rather than evil. And he loudly wonders whether he knows Dorian at all and wishes he were able to see the man's soul. Dorian laughs bitterly at this and tells the artist he shall have this wish. He invites him to show, he invites Basil rather, to show him his life. In chapter 13, Dorian leads Basil to the room where he keeps the painting locked inside 
Dorian then lights a candle as he takes him into where he's hidden his art and he tears back the curtain to reveal the portrait, which is now hideous. Basil stares at it and he is horrified and Dorian stands back and watches Basil with, as the novel says, a flicker of triumph in his eyes. When Basil asks how such a thing is possible, Dorian reminds him of the fateful day that he met Lord Henry, whose cautionary words about the ephemeral nature of beauty caused him to pledge his soul for eternal unblemished use. Basil curses the painting as an awful lesson, believing he worshipped his youth too much, and is now being punished for it. He begs Dorian to kneel and pray for forgiveness, but Dorian claims it's too late. Glancing at his picture, Dorian feels hatred welling up within him. He seizes a knife and stabs Basil repeatedly, killing him. He then hides his belongings and body in a secret compartment and then slips out quietly. After a few moments, he returns home. He wakes his servant and creates an impression that he's been out all night, and the servant reports back to him that Basil has been to visit. However, Dorian pretends that he's sorry to have missed him, so that he can have an alibi. Now in chapter 14, the next morning, Dorian wakes up from a very restful sleep. Once the events of the previous night sink in, he feels the return of all of his hatred for Basil. He decides not to brood on the things he for fear of making himself ill or mad and after breakfast he sends for Alan Campbell who's a young scientist and a former friend from whom he's grown distance. While waiting for Campbell to arrive he passes the time with a book of poems to reflect on his once intimate relationship with the science scientist. We learn that he and Alan Campbell were at one point inseparable. He also draws pictures and reflects on his drawing similarity to Basil's likeliness. Dorian then wonders if Campbell will come and is relieved when the servant announces his arrival. Alan Campbell, however, has come reluctantly, having been summoned on a matter of life and death. Dorian confesses to him that there's a dead man locked in the uppermost room of his house. He refrains from discussing the circumstances of the man's death, however, he asks Campbell to use his knowledge of chemistry to destroy the body. At first, Campbell refuses and he reiterates that he has no interest in being involved. However, Dorian blackmails him, threatening to reveal a secret that will bring great disgrace on him. With no alternative, Campbell agrees to dispose of the body and he sends a servant to his home for the necessary scientific equipment. Dorian goes upstairs to cover the portrait and notices that one of the hands on the painting is dripping with red. And the novel says, as though the canvas has sweated blood. Campbell then goes upstairs after the painting has been covered and he works until the evening and leaves. When Dorian returns to the room, the body is gone and the odour of nitric acid fills the room. Now in chapter 15, that evening, Dorian goes to a dinner party where he flirts with bored noble women. Reflecting on his calm demeanour, he feels keenly the terrible pleasure of, the novel says, a double life. Lady Narborough, the hostess, discusses the sad life of her daughter who lives in a region of the countryside that has not witnessed scandal since the time of Queen Elizabeth. Dorian finds the party tedious and brightens only when he learns Lord Henry will be in attendance. During dinner, after Lord Henry has arrived, Dorian finds it impossible to eat. Lord Henry asks him what the matter and Lady Narborough suggests that Dorian perhaps is in love. However, Dorian assures her that she is wrong. The party goes and talk wittily about marriage, and Lord Henry and Dorian discuss a party to be held at Dorian's country estate. Lord Henry then casually asks about Dorian's whereabouts the night before, and Dorian's calm facade cracks a little bit and he snaps out a strange defensive response. He then decides to go home early. Once Dorian arrives home, he retrieves Basil's belongings from the wall compartment and burns them. He goes to an ornate cabinet and, opening one of its drawers, draws out a canister of opium. At midnight, he dresses in common clothes and hires a coach to bring him to a London neighbourhood where the city's opium dens are. Now in chapter 16, as the coach heads out towards the opium den, Dorian recites to himself Lord Henry's credo. To cure the soul by means of the senses and the senses by the means of the soul. He decides that if he can't be forgiven by sins, he can at least forget them, and herein lies the appeal of the opium dens and the oblivion that they promise. 
The coach stops and Dorian exits. He enters a squalid den and finds someone called Adrian Singleton, whom the rumour says Dorian corrupted. As Dorian prepares to leave, a woman addresses him as the Devil's Bargain and Prince Charming. At these words, a sailor leaps to his feet and follows Dorian to the street. As he walks along, Dorian wonders whether he should feel the guilty for the impact he's had on Adrian Singleton's life, yet another person who's he's damaged. His meditation, however, is cut short when he sees from behind and held at gunpoint. He faces James Vane, Sybil's brother, who's been tracking him for years in hopes of avenging his sister's death. James doesn't know Dorian's name. However, the reference to Prince Charming makes him decide that he must be the man who wronged his sister. Dorian points out, however, that the man James speaks seeks was in love with Sybil 18 years ago. Since he, Dorian, has the face of a 20-year-old man, he possibly cannot be the man that wronged Sybil. James, fooled, releases him and makes his way back to the opium den. The old woman, when he returns, tells James that Dorian had been coming there for 18 years and his face has never aged a day all his life. Furious at letting Dorian escape, James resolves to hunt him down. Now going on to chapter 17 and 18. One week has passed and Dorian has retreated to his country estate, Selby Royal. His guests include the beautiful Duchess of Monmouth, called Gladys, her older, boring and somewhat jaded husband, Lady Marlborough, who's old and flirtatious, and Lord Henry. The conversation that takes place in this party is very light and superficial, and Lord Henry wants to rechristen and rename some things, especially flowers. Beautiful objects should have beautiful names, he says. The Duchess asks what new name Lord Henry shall have, and Dorian immediately answers appropriately, Prince Paradox. The Duchess then tries to flirt with Dorian, and he excuses himself to fetch her some of his orchids. Lord Henry light-heartedly warns the Duchess about loving Dorian. Suddenly, the group hears a muted groan and the sound of a heavy fall. Lord Henry rushes to find that Dorian has fainted. When Dorian wakes up, he refuses to be alone. Despite his condition, he joins the others at dinner and tries to act jolly. However, every so, every so often, terror shoots through him as he recalls why he fainted. He saw James Vane observing him through a window. Dorian spends the next, most of the next day in his room, feeling haunted and stalked and sick with fear of death. He alternates between the certainty of punishment and an equal certainty that the wicked receive no such fate in the world. He concludes that the only morality is the success of the strong and the failure of the weak. On the third day, Dorian finally goes out. He decided that he imagined James's face at the window. After breakfast, he strolls in the garden with the Duchess for an hour. Then he joins her brother, Sir Geoffrey Colston, and others who are shooting birds. A hare bursts forth and Sir Geoffrey aims. But Dorian so admires the beauty and grace of the animal that he cries, let it live. Lord Geoffrey finds Dorian's plea silly and fires at the hare as it jumps into a thicket. Two sounds come from the bush, the cry of a hare and the cry of a man. We then learn that a dead body is pulled from the brush. Lord Henry recommends calling off the hunt for the day. Dorian wants to cancel this hideous and cruel hunt for good. He fears that this death is a bad omen. Lord Henry, however, laughs at his concern, saying that anything horrible in life is boredom. There are no omens. In his room, Dorian lies in terror at the sofa. Later, he calls his servant and tells him to pack. He will leave 8.30 to catch the night express to London. Thornton, Dorian's chief gamekeeper, however, enters with startling news. The dead man can't be identified. He wasn't one of the beaters at all, the people who are supposed to be working there. In fact, he seems to be a sailor who was armed with a gun. Dorian then rushes to where the body is and he identifies it as James Vane's and he feels safe at last. Now in chapter 19, several weeks have passed and Dorian visits Lord Henry. He claims he wants to reform himself and become virtuous. As evidence for his newfound resolve, he describes a recent recent trip he went to the country during which he passed up an opportunity to seduce and defile an innkeeper's innocent daughter. Lord Henry dismisses Dorian's intentions to reform and he turns the conversation to other subjects. For instance, Alan Campbell's recent suicide, the man that had helped Dorian Gray dispose of Basil's body. And also, he discusses the continued mystery of Basil's Hallward's disappearance. Dorian asks if Lord Henry has ever considered that Basil might have been murdered. Lord Henry dismisses this idea, noting that Basil lacked any enemies. The conversation then drifts away from Basil. Lord Henry asks Dorian, 
What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose? How does the quotation run? His own soul? Dorian starts nervously. However, Lord Henry explains that he heard a street preacher posing this question to a crowd. He mocks this preacher in typical fashion, and Dorian cuts him short, insisting that the soul is very real. Lord Henry laughs at the suggestion, wondering aloud how Dorian has managed to remain so young after all these years. He wishes he knew Dorian's secret and praises Dorian's life as being exquisite. He commends Dorian's mode of living and begs him not to spoil it by trying to be virtuous. However, Dorian is sober and he somberly asks his friend not to loan anyone else this yellow book, which had a corrupting effect on his own character. Before leaving, Lord Henry invites Dorian to visit him the next day. Now in chapter 20, that night, Dorian goes to his locked room to look at his portrait. He hopes his decision to amend his life will have changed the painting and he considers that perhaps his decision not to ruin the innkeeper's daughter's reputation will be reflected in the painted face. However, when he looks at his portrait, he sees there's no change, except, as the novel states, in the eyes there was a look of cunning, and in the mouth, the curved wrinkle of a hypocrite. Dorian realises his pitiful attempt to be good was no more than hypocrisy, an attempt to minimise the seriousness of his crimes, which falls far short of atonement. He's furious, so he seizes a knife, the same weapon that he used to kill Basil, and drives it into the portrait in an attempt to destroy it. From below, Dorian hears Dorian's servants hear a cry and a clatter. The servants break into the room, only to see a portrait, unharmed, showing Dorian Gray as a beautiful young man. On the floor, however, is the body of an old man, horribly wrinkled and disfigured, with a knife plunged into his heart. It's not until the servants examine the rings on the old man's hands that they identify him as Dorian Gray. Now, when it comes to the characters themselves, of course, the first is Dorian Gray. So at the opening, he appears as something of an ideal. He's the archetype of male youth and beauty, and as such, he captures the imagination of Basil Hallward, who's a painter, and Lord Henry Wotton, a nobleman, who imagines fashioning the impressionable young Dorian into an unremitting pleasure seeker. In other words, a hedonist. We learn that Dorian is exceptionally vain, and he's convinced in the course of a brief conversation with Lord Henry in his most salient characteristics, his youth and physical attractiveness, and he's worried that they're waning. The thought of waking up one day without these attributes sends him into a panic. He curses his fate and thus makes a Faustian pact that, in exchange, his portrait should age and not he. Dorian leaves Basil's studio for Lord Henry's Palace, where he adopts the tenets of a new hedonism and resolves to live life as a pleasure seeker with no regard for conventional morality. His relationship with Sybil Vane tests his commitment to his philosophy. His love of the young actress nearly leads him to dispense with Lord Henry's teaching, but his love proves to be as shallow as he is. When he breaks Sybil's heart and drives her to suicide, Dorian notices the first change in his portrait, evidence that his portrait is showing the effects of age and experience while his body remains ever youthful. He experiences a moment of crisis as he weighs his guilt about his treatment of Sybil against the freedom from worry that Lord Henry's philosophy has espoused. When Dorian decides to view Sybil's death as an achievement of an artistic ideal rather than a needless tragedy for which he's responsible, he starts down the sleep and slippery slope of his own demise. As his sins grow worse over the years, his likeliness to Basil's portrait grows more hideous. Despite the few beautiful things he surrounds himself, he's unable to distract himself from the dispassion of his soul. His murder of Basil marks the beginning of his end. Although in the past he's been able to keep infamies from his mind, he can't shake the thought that he's killed his friend. His guilt tortures him relentlessly until he's forced to do away with his portrait. In the end, Dorian is punished for his ability to be influenced. If the new social order celebrates individualism, as Lord Henry claims, Dorian falters because he fails to establish and live by his own moral code. The next significant character is Lord Henry Wotton. So Lord Henry is a man possessed of, as the novel states, wrong, fascinating, poisonous, delightful theories. He's a charming talker and he has brilliant it and wit and intellect. Given the alluring way in which he leads conversation, it's unsurprising that Dorian falls under his spell completely. His theories are radical, they aim to shock and purposefully attempt to topple the established conventional notions of truth. However, in the end, they do prove naive. It's interesting that he's a relatively static character, he doesn't undergo a significant change in the course of the narrative. 
He's clearly composed, unshakable, and possessed of the same dry wit in the final pages of the novel as he is upon the introduction. Because he doesn't change whilst Dory and Basil do, his philosophy seems amusing and enticing in the first half of the book, and then improbable and shallow in the second half. Although Lord Henry is a self-proclaimed hedonist who advocates equal pursuit of moral and immoral experiences, it's interesting to note that he participates in polite London society, attends parties and theatre, and doesn't himself indulge in sordid behaviour, unlike Dorian, who he corrupts. The next character, of course, is Basil Hallward. So he's a very talented painter, and his love for Dorian Gray changes the way he sees art. Indeed, it defines a new school for expression for him. Basil's portrait of Dorian marks a new phase in his career. Before he created this masterwork, masterwork, he spent his time painting Dorian in the veils of antiquity, dressed as an ancient soldier or as various romantic figures from mythology. Once he's painted Dorian as he truly is, however, he fears he's put too much of himself in his work, and he worries that his love, which he himself describes as idolatry, is too apparent. Though he later changes his mind not to exhibit his portrait, he still maintains a belief that art is always more abstract than one thinks, and it's interesting that his belief changes from paintings revealing his soul to paintings betraying nothing than the form and colour. However, throughout the novel, Basil Howard's emotional investment in Dorian remains constant and he seeks to protect Dorian, voicing his objection from Lord Henry's injurious influence over him. Now, when it comes to important themes, the first, of course, is youth and beauty. So, youth and beauty are the first principle of asceticism, and this is the philosophy of art by which Oscar Wilde himself lived, and this is that art serves no other purpose than to offer beauty. Throughout this novel, beauty reigns. It's a means to revitalise the wearied senses, as indicated by the effect that Basil's painting has on the cynical Lord Henry. Art is also a means of escaping the brutalities of the world. Dorian distances himself, not to mention his consciousness, from the horrors of his actions by devoting himself to the study of beautiful things, including music, jewels, and rare tapestries. In a society that prizes beauty so highly, youth and physical attractiveness becomes valuable commodities. Lord Henry describes Dorian of as much upon the meeting as when he laments that Dorian will soon enough lose these precious attributes. In chapter 17, the Duchess of Monmouth suggests to Lord Henry that he places too much value on these things. Indeed, Doran's eventual demise confirms his suspicions. Although beauty and youth remain of utmost importance in the end of the novel, the portrait is returned to its original form, and the novel appears to suggest that the price one must pay for beauty and youth is exceedingly high. Indeed, Dorian gives nothing less than his soul. The next theme, of course, is superficiality. So it's no surprise that a society which prizes beauty above all else is a society founded on a love of surfaces. What matters most to Dorian, Lord Henry, and the polite company that they keep is not whether a man is good at heart, but rather if he's handsome. As Dorian evolves into the realisation of a type, the perfect blend of scholar and socialite, he experiences a freedom to abandon his morals without censure. Indeed, even though, as Basil warns, society's elite question his name and reputation, He's actually never ostracised. On the contrary, despite his mode of life, he remains at the heart of London's social scenes because of the innocence and purity of his beauty and face. Of course, another important theme is the purpose of art. So when this book was first published, it was decried as immoral. In a revising text the following year, Wilde included a preface, which serves as a useful ex explanation for his philosophy of art. The purpose of art, according to a series of epigrams, is to have no purpose. In order to understand this claim fully, one needs to consider the moral climate of Wilde's time and the Victorian sensibility regarding art and morality. Victorians believed that art could be used as a tool for social education and moral enlightenment, as illustrated in the works by writers such as Charles Dickens and George Gissing. The asceticism movement, of which Wilde was a major proponent, sought to free art from his responsibility. If this philosophy informed Wilde's life, however, we must then consider whether this, is, this novel only bears it out. The two works of art that dominate this novel, Basil's painting and the mysterious yellow book that Lord Henry gives Dorian but we never quite know who it's by, are presented in the vein of more Victorian sensibilities than of aesthetic ones. That is to say, both the portrait and the French novel serve a purpose. <laughs> 
The first acts as a type of mysterious mirror that shows Dorian the physical dissipation of his own body has been spared, while the second acts as something of a roadmap, leading the young man further along the path toward infamy. While we know nothing of the circumstances of the Yellow Book's composition, Basil's state of mind while painting Dorian's portrait is clear. Later in the novel, he advocates that all art be, as the novel states, unconscious, ideal, and remote. His portrait of Dorian, however, is anything but. Thus, Basil's initial refusal to exhibit the work results from his belief that it betrays his idolatry of his subject. Of course, one might consider that these breaches of aesthetic philosophy mould the picture of Dorian Gray into something that's a cautionary tale. These are the prices that must be paid for instilling art which reveals the artist's or a moral lesson. But this warning is, in itself, a moral lesson which betrays the impossibility of Wilde's project. If, as Dorian observes late in the novel, the imagination orders the chaos of life and invests it with meaning, then art, as the fruit of imagination, can't help but mean something. Wilde may have succeeded in freeing his art from the confines of Victorian morality, but as he has replaced it with a doctrine that is, in his own way, restrictive. So that's all. If you enjoyed this video, do subscribe to our channel and give this video a thumbs up. But also do make sure you visit our website, www.firstreetutors.com, where you'll find useful revision guides, model answers written at an A grade level, and exam papers you can use to practice this novel or many other novels as well as compare them for that matter. Thank you so much for listening.